Welcome to the Block and Tackle Show, hosted by Carl Block. Carl is a partner in the law firm of Loeb & Loeb here in Los Angeles, California. He will be tackling some of the biggest issues in business today. Listen, learn, and enjoy as he leaves no stone unturned during deep conversations with some of today's most amazing business leaders. Welcome to the show. Carl Block is both a corporate lawyer and a corporate restructuring partner in the Los Angeles office of Loeb & Loeb LLP. Nothing in the podcast should be construed as legal advice. To the extent legal issues are discussed, please consult an attorney if you have any questions or need advice relating to the matters discussed. This podcast may constitute attorney advertising in certain jurisdictions. The views expressed in the podcast are not necessarily the views of Loeb & Loeb or Carl Block. Carl and each guest reserves the right to change any opinions that may be expressed on the show and disagree with what others say, even if such disagreement is not expressed during the podcast. Welcome to today's episode of the Block and Tackle Show. My name is Carl Block and I am your host today. And for this episode, I'm very pleased that I have an amazing guest, Professor Steve Hankey. Dr. Hankey is a professor of applied economics and the founder and co-director of the Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health, and the Study of Business Enterprise at the Johns Hopkins University. Among other things, in his storied career, he served on President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. He was a senior advisor to the Joint Economic Committee of the United States Congress and has worked with countries, it seems, and has set up currency regimes in seven or eight countries and counting. And frankly, Dr. Hankey or Steve, some of these Eastern Bloc countries haven't gotten together and had the Hankey currency or trading bloc, given how many of them you've helped with their economic situations and, uh, and currency issues. It's really amazing. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me, Carl. Good to be back with, with one of my former students. There you go. So, you know, before we get into some of the issues about the Fed and some of the countries that we're going to talk about today, what, what I, uh, you know, there have been two things on my mind. One is you seem to write a lot, publish a lot, content is really good. You can't be a one-man band. You must have people that support you. Oh, I, I definitely do. You're exactly right. Uh, I founded, as you mentioned, uh, with Professor Lou Galambas, the Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health, and the Study of Business Enterprise at Johns Hopkins. And I, I've, uh, d depending on the time of year and so forth, I've got around 30 assistants working with me. So, uh, and and most most of these are are bright, energetic undergraduates who who eventually want to go to Wall Street, uh, or now some actually want to get into the consulting world, and they they do that and they do very well. So, and occasionally one will slip by like you and go to law school and. <laughs> so, it, it happened. It, 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 it when, when you were my student, by the way. It, it was a pretty much a one man band, but you know, with, with age, you, you just can't age and, and, and many more demands on your time and commitments and things, things like that. You, you, you can't do the one man band anymore. You really have to have some help and, and uh, it's, it's great help. And, and I think it's a great way to train young people and, particularly to teach them the five P's, which Jim Baker, when he was White House Chief of Staff, taught me, prior preparation prevents poor performance. <laughs> Those five P's are great. I, I, I would imagine since your stuff is so widely published, there's a lot of people in foreign governments, in industry, or, um, at, or policymakers who benefit from all the stuff the Institute does. And do you self-fund? Does Hopkins help you? or what? Yeah. Uh, we, uh, Lou and I have always taken the position that, that we would, we would self-fund the Institute. Now, what that means, we, we pass the begging bowl and, and receive gifts. And, and all 
all the funding into the thing, we also have another rule. And the rule is that the expenditures only go to finance research assistance, that means students at Hopkins, and, or, or, or a, a purchase, you know, the occasional supplies you need, paper, and every, every once in a while your computer clonks out and you've got to replace it. But, but basically, all, all the money goes to, to do what? Do, do what Hopkins does. It's a research university. It, it's, th those gifts fund research. So, um, and, and by the way, people don't realize, you know, uh, just you, you probably, I'm glad you're sitting down on the chair, but when you say research university, there, there's just nothing like it in, in the world. Hopkins has approximately 5,500 undergraduates. Now that's a, that's a long way from where it was 54 years ago when I joined the faculty. We had 1,500 undergraduates and, and we undergraduate uh, enrollment was not even co-ed when I joined. So, so a lot, a lot has changed. We have co-ed now, and and we have a, a much larger undergraduate body. But I said 5,500 undergraduates. We have 25,000 graduate students. I, I, it's very unique, and it's one of the few universities that I think I've seen where the graduate student population is so much greater. Very, very unusual. But I guess it gives you a, enough talent pool to help do this, so that you're actually uh, you're actually able to publish what you publish. And I hope people watching this podcast will take a hard look at what the institute does and perhaps make contributions to help fund what you need to do. I, you know, I I really appreciate the stuff you put out, and I'm sure other people will too if they take a look at it. Well, thanks for that. Uh opportunity to discuss the Institute because it, it, it's just a great research platform. And, uh, and by the way, the undergraduates, basically the, the, the graduate and research environment is, is so overwhelming at Hopkins that, that the undergraduates kind of get in the groove. And, and I remember, by the way, that when I first arrived 54 years ago, uh, Wilson Schaffer was the grand, grand old man of Johns Hopkins, uh, professor of psychology and dean and et cetera. But he, he was really running the show. And I asked Wilson what he advised in terms of teaching and pedagogy with the undergraduates and he said oh you, you take them over to the Eisenhower library and throw them in the deep end and see if they can swim <laughs> so that, that's not it that's not as quite it what it now it's it's a little bit more like a normal undergraduate college in that sense but it still has that flavor you take take them over to the Eisenhower library throw them in the deep end and see if they can swim and if they can great in a tough school and uh, I think it makes leaders um, by virtue of the environment and having an amazing faculty. Of course, you are one of those. So let me let me talk a little bit about something else. You know, some of the things that you've done, you know, you are the hyperinflation killer. There's no doubt about that. You've worked with so many countries throughout Latin America and Europe and you know, on the human side, I, I think there's probably, there's not necessarily an appreciation of the risk that you take doing this kind of work. And when you're radically or significantly trying to change how an economy works, you maybe make some enemies or have made enemies before? Oh, you, you, you better believe it. You, 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 you're, if you're doing, if if you're in, in there proposing a significant reform that's going to change the whole institutional setup of the country, uh, you're you're a threat to a, a, a lot of a lot of political people and 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 or bureaucracy. So, uh, I think one of the there there have been three three occasions. One. one this very documented, which I'll mention, uh, in which the danger was 
very elevated and uh, elevated to the point that I, I was a target of a state-sponsored assassination attempt. Fortunately, they didn't get me. That that was in that was in the rump Yugoslavia, which was made up of Serbia and Montenegro. I was the state counselor in Montenegro and the chief advisor of Milo Djokanovic, who was the president. And the currency of the realm of the rump Yugoslavia was the hyperinflating Yugoslav dinar. And I recommended to uh, Djokanovic that we replace the dinar with a German mark. So it would be like the state of New York deciding they were going to replace the US dollar with the Euro. <laughs> and, and, and that happened to upset very much uh, Milosevic, who was the leader of the Grump Yugoslavia, Slobodan Milosevic, and, and, and uh, he, he didn't like it. I mean, to the point of he, he actually had tanks on the border in 1999, in December, when when we did dollarize Montenegro and replace the dinar with the German mark, now of, of course the the stories on the on the wire service on the state wire service were amazing because I was accused of being a, a counterfeiter who was importing counterfeit dinars into Serbia to destabilize Milosevic and the government. That, that was one charge. Then, then the other more serious one was that I was, the lead, I was a French secret agent in charge of a small group of three people called the Spider Group. And the Spider Group was going to do what? We were going to assassinate Milosevic. Wow. So, 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 so that that that's that's the most visible one. The the other two were in Indonesia when I was President Suharto's advisor, chief advisor in the Asian financial crisis. Now I, I was proposing a currency board system, not not a dollarization, not a replacement of the Indonesian rupiah with a foreign currency like the U.S. dollar. I was proposing a currency board like like the ones I just installed in 1997 in Bulgaria and in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And, and that system would have meant that the Indonesian rupiah would have been issued by the in Indonesian currency board and it would be fully backed by US dollar reserves and it would trade at a fixed exchange rate with the US dollar and be fully convertible and, and free, freely exchangeable. Now, that kind of system, the, the rupiah, uh, by the way, would have been equivalent to the US dollar under that currency board arrangement. That's the same kind of system they have in Hong Kong today. In Hong Kong, the Hong Kong dollar trades for 7.8 Hong Kong for one US, and it's fully backed by US dollars. So the, the Hong Kong dollar is a clone of the US dollar. So that was a proposal. Well, there were a lot of people that didn't like that because they wanted to get rid of Suharto. They wanted the situation to remain destabilized with food riots and soaring prices, you know, and triple digit prices and a, and a collapsing rupiah. Well, uh, when Suharto took on my currency board idea and in uh, and his state of the state address, said that he was going to adopt it, all hell broke loose. There were, there were a lot, a lot of people didn't like that. All the people who didn't want stability to come back to Indonesia during the Asian financial crisis, they, they wanted the crisis to eliminate Suharto, which eventually he, he caved in and did not introduce the currency board. And, and uh, of course, the Within 30 days after he said he was not going to do that, uh, he was gone. He was a goner. By the way, the first day he announced that I was going to be his advisor, the, 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 the rupiah rallied on the spot market and the one-year forward market in Singapore by 28%.
wow. one of the greatest currency rallies in history. And, and, and all, all he did, he, he said, Professor Hankey is going to be my chief advisor from now on. You know, again, I don't think a lot of people knew this about you. And it's really good that you were able to come on and talk to me about this. And, and a lot of times, as you know, when you deal with economics, even applied economics, people look at the science or the math of how you use it. They don't always look at the human side of the cost that it has on people, how people may want to change the system, and frankly, the risk that you put yourself through to do some of this stuff. So that's it's actually well, very impressive. Well, we we ended up, Mrs. Hankey and I were always well, very well protected in Montenegro and Indonesia. By the way, in Indonesia, once Suharto got wind of what was going on, he he sent half of his personal security staff to guard me 24 seven. And, and, and he put all Mrs. Suharto had, had recently passed away and all of her security staff was on Mrs. Hankey's case. So we, we were, we, we didn't really think about this. People think, Oh boy, that, that must've been something. It, it, it was in fact, nothing uh, because we felt quite secure and taken care of, but, but that's the way it goes. Now you mentioned one thing, there, there is a technical aspect to all of this. So uh, you, that's, that's why that's why you went to Johns Hopkins to crack the crack the books, learn how learn how to use a sharp pencil and so forth. But but there's another aspect that's very important, and, and I think it's called tacit knowledge. Uh, Polanyi uh, elaborated on this the whole idea of tacit knowledge, and tacit knowledge is is what you can't learn in books. You can't learn it at the university. So a lot of my tacit knowledge, I, I started learning as a country boy in Iowa. That, that's that's where you learn the, the the ways of the world if if you're you know clued in and on top of things. Also, Mrs. Anki has also transmitted a great deal of tacit knowledge to me. So the combination is very important. You, you can't do this just by doing sharp pencil work. You, you, you've, you've got to have some, some common sense and some, some intuition about how, how the world works. Let's put it that way. I, I, I think so, and probably some emotional intelligence uh, and uh, how you, what human nature is, what people want. You, you know, you, a lot of what you do can be disruptive. And as we know, not everybody takes well to that. Well, the, con the, the, the back to the Yugos rump Yugoslavia. Um, let, let's go back a little bit because this is this is relevant because there there is something connected to tacit knowledge, and that's being able to spot the openings and being able to be opportunistic. So, in late 1989, uh, of course, Yugoslavia the, the the Socialist Federation of Yugoslavia existed with all, with all a, a full array of, we had Croatia, Slovenia, uh, at, at Montenegro, and, and, and so forth. So one of our good friends, Daniel Swarovski of Swarovski Crystal fame, uh, an Austrian from Botten's Austria, Upper Austria, it was a very good friend of ours. He was a big supporter of Austrian economics, and, and I'm a, you know, if, if not an Austrian economist, I'm a, I'm a camp follower anyway. So, and, 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 and in 1989, he was very interested in introducing laissez-faire free market economics of, of the Austrian school variety into Eastern Europe and the Balkans. So, he arranged a dinner in Vienna uh, in honor of Mrs. Hankey and myself, and one of the guests was the vice president, vice premier of Yugoslavia, Jivko Pregel, who was in charge of all the economic reforms. Uh, we had a great dinner. At the end of dinner, Pregel asked if I would meet with him the next day, which I did, and we talked, he indicated he'd like to have me as an, his chief advisor. And I said, uh, I, I'm hesitant, I'm skeptical about this. And the reason for that skepticism was he, 
he was the leader of the Communist League. That means the Communist Party, the League in, in Yugoslavia. And I said, I'm, I'm a free market economist. And he said, well, that's exactly why I want you to, as an advisor, I, I don't want half-baked advice uh, the Markovic government, Markovic was the prime minister at the time, uh, Prego was the vice premier. He said, we, we want to reform things and, and you know, re replace the socialist system that we have with a free market system. And I said, well, I'll take you up on that offer, but you, you've, you've, you've got to uh, disband the Communist Party in Yugoslavia. And if you do, I'll become your advisor. And, and he said, in short, how the hell are we going to do that? <laughs> and I gave him what I thought was an appropriate blueprint. He, he executed perfectly, and the League, the Communist League, collapsed. And that's so I, I, be, I, be, I became Pragel's personal economic advisor in Jan January 1st of 1990 and was until a civil war broke out in, in May, June of 1991. So, so the Yugoslav, there's more to the, to the picture than, than just Montenegro. Yeah, Montenegro is in there originally. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, the capital uh, hadn't changed its name yet. The first time I went down to the capital of Montenegro in 1990. It was called Tito Grad. It's called Podgorica now. Uh, so, so at any rate, there, there, there are a lot of interesting war stories, but that, that one is interesting because num number one, we, we did have a good friend uh, in Swarovski who was quite an influential personality. And we used an opportunity popped up and and you know as they say one thing led to another it's a great story thanks for tuning in if you want more info on the show please visit block and tackle show.com and you can also email me at carl at block and tackle show.com thanks for tuning in